1967. In the middle of the Cold War, the Soviets unveiled a brand new fighting vehicle. It was fast, heavily armed, and ran on tracks. But the real surprise lay inside, where this new machine carried soldiers who could fire their weapons on the move. This was the birth of the tracked infantry fighting vehicle, the Russian BMP-1, built to survive a nuclear battlefield. The BMP was designed to fight a war that never happened. The BMP forced the US Army to come up with its own version, the devastating M2 Bradley. In Gulf War I, this American powerhouse completely overwhelmed the BMP. And we were butchering those things left and right in, uh, in armored stand-up fights. Many were left to rot in the desert. But thanks to one true believer, a BMP-1 is about to get a complete overhaul. With a tiny budget, volunteer crews, and not enough time. Oh, oh, the camera. Holy moly. This is one long, unforgiving mission. What's the deal? Again. There are two ways to overhaul a massive piece of military hardware. The easy way, with a big budget and a big crew. Or the Greg Taylor way, with no money, a great group of friends, and as many guns as possible. Everybody's got guns out here. The sound of gunfire out here means the sound of freedom. In the vast Nevada desert, Greg Taylor and his pals are living the dream. And they're doing it in a corner of the continent that has witnessed some amazing feats of engineering. This is also where NASA built and tested the Apollo rockets. This is great open space for having men's toys. <laughs> or large boys' toys. Greg, do you have anything around here that isn't worth a dollar two ninety-eight that we can no, use? No, but it's not a hobby. Uh, it has been a hobby for a long time. I'm not sure what we would call it. Torture. Maybe it's torture. What the hell are you doing? But I thought I'd save us a little bit of f***ing time. Who in the f*** died and left you, boss? Greg's beat up and battered BMP needs some serious cosmetic work, a major engine rebuild, and tons of electrical wiring. To make this happen, he's pulled together old friends and fellow tank restorers. Okay, watch yourself. Come In on. this playground, Greg is the master builder. He's worked with Soviet vehicles, of course, German vehicles, French vehicles, etc. And I do not know if there's anybody else that has as much experience as Greg Taylor. Yeah, I bought that vehicle sight unseen in England in 2003 and had it shipped in. But Greg can't work on his BMP full time. He restores military vehicles at one of the world's largest private collections owned by Jacques Littlefield. It's a great job, but is a four hour drive from his own personal playground at his Paradis Ranch 30 miles northeast of Reno. Greg has spent years just trying to get started restoring his BMP-1. Repairing the BMP is like, uh, well, I don't know what you would say comparing it to, but it's, it's just terribly cramped and, and complicated, and you know, there's all these plumbing. It's a plumber's nightmare. There's, there's plumbing going everywhere in there. It's absolutely hideous. Appearing for the first time in 1967, the BMP was a major innovation on the battlefield. The BMP was designed part light tank, part armored personnel carrier in the Cold War for nuclear battlefields. The BMP-1 was really the first of what we now call infantry fighting vehicles. That means an infantry vehicle that's designed not simply to bring infantry into combat and have them disembark and fight on foot. It was designed to allow the infantry to fight from within the vehicle. 
In the 1950s, the Soviets had a dilemma about how to use infantry on a battlefield that was going to be contaminated by nuclear weapons. Obviously, unprotected human beings can't survive on a nuclear battlefield. The Russians wanted more than just a battlefield taxi dropping off troops. So what separated the BMP from earlier types of armored infantry vehicles is not only could they survive on the nuclear battlefield, they could fight on the nuclear battlefield. Unlike any other tracked vehicle, the infantry inside were able to shoot through firing ports in the hull. The crew would be protected from nuclear fallout by the composition and thickness of the hull. A chemical filtration system would keep the air inside free from contaminants. The BMP was in many ways a very ambitious design. It was also an awful lot of firepower and an awful lot of features in a relatively small, relatively light, relatively fast vehicle. In 1981, the American Army introduced their own version of an infantry fighting vehicle, the M2 Bradley. Even at 33 metric tons, twice the weight of the BMP, this vehicle could still match the BMP's top speed of 65 kilometers or 40 miles per hour. It has the uh, capabilities to um, haul troops into battle and fight its way in and fight its way out. When the Bradley was first developed, it was designed for conventional warfare where the, the battle was fought from by opposing forces from the front. In a current conflict, it's what they call an asymmetrical battlefield, whereas you can expect threats from all sides around you, 360 degrees. And so the, the Bradley and the BMP were kind of evenly matched at the time because it was the Bradley was new to the battlefield. Each had anti-tank missiles. Uh, they had the Sager, we had the tow, and we had fire ports for our 5.56, and they had fire points for their AK-47s. But that's pretty much where it ends as an equal race. After that, it became completely unfair. The Bradley evolved quicker and faster than the BMP could even begin to keep pace. All the U.S. military skill and technology quickly came to bear. Building on what the BMP had introduced, the Bradley took it to the next level. You go to any uh, observation post, you go to any checkpoint, and if you have one of these bad boys sitting there, that sends a message to the enemy. You know, you can put a Humvee or you can put a soldier on the ground with a weapon, but if you're sitting behind a 72-ton tank or the M2 or M3 Bradley, the, the reality is the enemy doesn't want to mess around with you. Like I said, it sends a message. Equipped with a 25-millimeter cannon, the Bradley's main gun can fire 200 rounds a minute, both armor-piercing and high-explosive. But the real beauty that the Bradley brings to, to the urban fight when you drop the ramp and those seven flat-bellied, barrel-chested, steely-eyed killers come rolling off the back with uh, some of the finest lead uh, soldiers and best-trained soldiers in the world. That is really the equalizer to the enemy force that the Bradley brings. There's no other vehicle on the earth that delivers that kind of lethality, uh, pinpoint accuracy like the Bradley does. Bringing the troops to the fight was the BMP's innovation. Protecting them was another story. The BMP's armor was a lethal liability because the troops sat either side of the central fuel tank and ammunition store. All of the ammunition is lined up underneath the turret. If they get penetrated through the very thin side armor, all that stuff blows up, and it blows up right next to the fuel tanks. So the BMP is a very impressive design in its technical features, but it's very, very vulnerable if it's used in an environment where its weak side armor, or weak rear armor is exposed to the enemy. When it comes to armor, the M2 Bradley is an impregnable fortress. The basic level of protection of the vehicle is, is steel armor uh, that's added to the front and sides and top of the vehicle. And that provides uh, 30 millimeter protection from uh, opposing uh, forces. I've been in nine IED blasts while I was in Iraq and the Bradley fighting vehicle was able to bring my crews home safe. I only had to evacuate one soldier, and he was evacuated for a broken leg. He was my driver during one of the, the worst IED attacks. Built in the 1960s, Greg's BMP has driven a long, winding trail all the way from Eastern Europe through the Middle East to Western Nevada. In the 1980s, it fought in the Iran-Iraq War. 
During the 1991 Gulf War, the British Army captured it from Iraqi forces. They brought back uh, a few samples and they tested them and they were evaluating their, the Russian technology at that time. Because there hadn't been a lot of these captured until uh, the 1991 Gulf War. This is one piece of equipment that didn't spend life on the sidelines, and it's got the scars to prove it. Oh, the damage we have on this BMP, I believe, was, was incurred in the Iran-Iraq war. The damage you see here is, is quite deep into the armor plate. There's a gouge right here. There's also a big dent back here. So there was quite a bit of damage to this vehicle. For the first phase of his restoration, Greg pulls in Roy Robertson. He's got a lot of knowledge and, uh, and mechanical knowledge of the Russian equipment, because we worked together on a lot of that over the years. The first step in the restoration is sandblasting off the years of paint, dirt, and rust. Greg needs to get the BMP down to bare metal. When you're working on a tight budget with less than state-of-the-art equipment, sometimes even the simple things can go wrong. While we were sandblasting here, Greg Taylor had his hoses over here, didn't realize we had broken a, an airline right here that goes feeds his, uh, his mask. And then I ran over to spot what it was and sand blowing everywhere. So then I, I immediately head over to the machine, the uh, pump, and shut everything down. I have a statement about sandblasting. For every hour of sandblasting you do, you spend five hours working on the equipment. So it's, that's the part that I hate, working on the equipment. I, li I kind of like doing the work, but I, do, I just, the drudgery and the repairs, and I have, obviously I have, you know, up-to-date equipment here. This is, this is the latest thing that's available on the market. The hardest part, probably throwing these sacks of sand, you know, so as you get older, it's a little harder on the hemorrhoids. You know, I'd, I'd write a book, but the statute of limitation is not up on a lot of the stuff I did. <laughs> okay, we'll cut the and let's, let's get back yeah, to work, Yeah, okay? this thing is full. Okay, we're good. On Greg's budget, work sometimes has to wait for the equipment to get its act together. Now what's wrong? Fuel's on. Yeah, it is. Greg can't afford to lose time. He only has a few days at his ranch before he has to head back to his regular job in California. Yeah. Here in Nevada, Greg Taylor and Roy Robertson continue to beat this BMP back into full working condition. This is how it's done with no money. There's in. About 3,600 kilometers or 2,200 miles away from Greg Taylor's sandbox is the BAE Systems plant in York, Pennsylvania. At this state-of-the-art facility, they're rebuilding M2 Bradleys to get them back to Iraq. Since we're in, in a, a time of war, the op tempo has increased significantly for the Bradley fighting vehicle. Approximately 120 vehicles a month, an average of about eight a day that we'll be producing. Attacked and battered in Iraq, these Bradleys are coming back to life in the USA. But when the vehicle comes back from theater, they will assess it when they tear the vehicle down. Um, it's difficult to tell how much damage you have to a vehicle until the components are tore out. This vehicle came back from Iraq. Uh, it was in theater and it ran over an IED, um, basically an explosive device. This particular one had damage to the front and the entire floor and the engine compartment we had to cut out, um, which is what this guy's doing now. He's putting parts back into it now. To get the Bradleys restored, the crew has everything they need to get the job done right and fast. Need to pick up a couple of tons of armor? Not a problem. The uh, Bradleys were last new Bradley rolled off the production line in 1994. 
Since that time, we've been in a remanufacture state where we take old vehicles and recycle them into uh, new vehicles by adding, by upgrading them with new components and, and to bring them up to date. But deep in the land of Greg Taylor, restoring a single BMP-1 is a whole different grind. I, I did purchase an engine for it, so I'm, I'm really hoping the engine is okay and it's not, I've, I've been assured that it is a good engine. Uh, however, you never know until you actually are ready to start it up and run it. Greg is driving home to Nevada from his job restoring tanks for Collector Shock Littlefield. He's been making this out-of-state trip about every two weeks since 1994. Greg's love affair with military metal began when other kids were still messing around with plastic models. I ended up actually inheriting an old uh, 1941 Dodge weapons carrier, which I basically got running and cleaned up and painted and drove to high school. Greg eventually graduated to owning bigger vehicles and finally tanks. The first tank he owned was a T-54. I drove that tank for many years and used it in film work, such as Tank Girl and uh, Courage Under Fire and Mars Attacks and a couple of other ones I don't want to mention, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay. When he's off duty, he gets to work on his own projects. And right now, that's a Soviet BMP-1, pockmarked with battle scars. I just think they're, they're very sleek looking, they're Star Wars looking, they, they're fast, they're reliable and easy to drive. So I really wanted one. Then we'll take the turret off, I guess. According to government regulation, Greg is not allowed to restore the gun to full working condition, but he is allowed to get the engine up and running. Okay, Roy's putting on some oven cleaner on this engine that we bought from Eastern Don't Europe. Don't give up our secret. This is a Czech engine and transmission out of Czechoslovakia. And it's a low time, has low hours on it. These, these power packs were basically very reliable, and uh, we're taking a chance by just cleaning it up and changing the oil and putting it in the vehicle. So we'll see if it's, if it's what it's, uh, it was made out to be when I bought it. The BMP's engine is a 300 horsepower, six-cylinder diesel made in Czechoslovakia. Greg can't be sure this second-hand engine will work but he knows the original models were solid, dependable designs. In fact, I have a friend that has a BMP, and they've been driving it around for 15 years and never had the engine apart or, take, or out. Just incredibly reliable. Better, better get doing it before it freezes up the pressure washer. We're, we're right now, I think we're about 40 degrees out here in northern Nevada, and uh, we gotta get this done so we can put this puppy in there. We're in Nevada, I thought we were in Siberia. Shh. I'm not even gonna speculate what it is. <laughs> yeah, it looks a lot better. Look in there. That oh, that, all, sure. Remember, it was all oh, black. Or that drink, looks like brand, it looks like brand new. Yeah, it does. I guess it's got to hose off a little right There's here. There's a little bit down here on the side here on that, on the, uh, that's intake, intake manifold there. Yeah, I got to okay. put some more right here. And around, and around on the heads there, yeah. Yeah, but we can do that uh, tomorrow. Okay. But even on a no budget tank overhaul, Greg still needs to buy parts and pieces that can't be found in the local hardware store. When you're in a small business situation like we are, uh, you have to do what's called creative financing. So sometimes, you know, I'm shuffling things around and, and you know, it's not too bad. Sometimes we get caught, <laughs> you know, especially when we have, you have to come up with $3,000 for a new engine, you know, and that sort of thing. I saw the UPS truck come in again today. 
Yeah? What was it? Was it wasn't something for you? <laughs> no, it wasn't something oh. for me. That's why I'm asking. Okay, well, okay. it was cheap. Okay. That was, I ordered some bolts for the BMP deck. Okay, well, what credit, credit card did you use? The home card uh, or the... They're all full. Okay, the, it's not, oh, the home I card used, or the I business? I used the visa, business card. Okay, that's good. All right, well, that's all I needed to know. We're fine. I don't have to move money today. The BMP-1 was created to fight NATO forces during a nuclear strike in Europe. But those battles never happened. Instead, the BMP stormed into action across the deserts and mountains of the Middle East. The BMP was first used in the 1973 Mideast War. It was used by the Syrian army in their attack against the Israeli force on the Golan Heights. It wasn't very successful. The Syrians liked the BMP's speed and handling. Designed to be amphibious, it could cross soft, wet terrain that would trap other tanks. But the Syrian troops discovered serious drawbacks. The main 70 millimeter gun was less than two meters off the ground. This was low enough to hit fellow troops marching in front. The BMP's rear, where the gas was stored, could be penetrated by a 50 caliber machine gun. This was a design flaw that could spell disaster. When the BMP was moving, troops inside couldn't fire with any accuracy. But the BMP was not the reason the Syrians lost the 1973 war. Lack of success of the BMP on the Golan Height had less to do with the BMP and its design than the tactics used by the Syrian army and by the successful use of entrenched firepower by the Israeli army. It's, it's, it's very skillful tank forces on the Golan Height. After the October war, the Soviets began upgrading the BMP, but it would never become the equal of the Bradley. For Greg, working on an American unit would be much easier than his Russian BMP. At least he could read the instructions. One of the problems with these pieces of equipment is that the manuals themselves were either in, in uh, Russian or uh, German or uh, Czechoslovakian, you know, Czech. It's a new day in the Pahra Mountains. Greg Taylor has called on his gang of volunteers to overhaul a Russian antique, a Cold War relic, a veteran of the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf War, the first ever infantry fighting vehicle, the BMP-1. But it's not all fun and games in the land of heavy-duty tank overhauls. Is this thing plugged in? It uh, might be. Supposed to be. Broken. Greg, do you have anything around here that isn't worth a dollar two ninety eight that we can no, use? No, but you know that's all right. Huh? That's odd. Probably broke. So I, I do really need to go spend some money on some tools. It would be nice if there was uh, more money uh, to to build a bigger shop and and buy more toys. But you know, I'm happy with what I have, so. We're fine. The BMP has been sandblasted. The engine has been cleaned. Today, Greg's gang will attack the bodywork and battle damage and get the turret ready to come off. This is that this is that nickel weld, so you know it's harder than hubs of hell. So you gotta just kind of chew at it the best you can. I can't even cut this off, it's it's so tough. Okay. And then when you get down to where it's like that, that looks good. Use the little grinder to finish All it. All right, so I'll yeah. do them one at a time. Yeah. To share the pain and the glory, Roy Robertson is back on site. Also here today are neighbors John Glather and Bruce Cote. I usually get up every morning and, and try to decide what can make me the most miserable every day. And then I usually come up here and see Greg. He gives me something to do. We couldn't have restored Volkswagens or something like that. No, that'd be too damn easy, wouldn't it? Bruce Cote is a ex-sheriff. I've known him for a number of years as well, and he lives down the street here. So he, he kicked me in the butt and got me going, and uh, he's a good motivator. This thing was way beyond before we ever got it, okay? <laughs>
Well, that's the only thing we got. If you want to drive this thing, Bruce, it's going to be a lot of work. That's all I can say. All the guys are here because they believe in Greg and his mission to save these vehicles from history's junkyard. And he's so meticulous as when he's restoring it back to its original condition, you know. I mean, he is, he really is. He gets, he's overworked is what it is. But he is a good restorator, one of the best. Greg and neighbor Don Glather cut, torch, and grind, while Roy and ex-sheriff Bruce Cote remove the bolts and linkages, keeping the turret in place. I'm cleaning the out of the bottom so we can get to the nuts. I've got rusty nuts in the bottom of this thing, okay? We thought that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, challenging enough unless we filled the bottom of the BMP up with about two or three inches of uh, sand before we tried to take the, the nuts off, you know? During the ordeal inside, Bruce finds a reminder of the BMP's battle history. No, I'm serious. There's bullet holes through the bottom of this. Somebody must have been shooting at this at one time. August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Five months later, led by the United States, a UN-backed force confronted the Iraqi army. The Iraqis were still using original BMP-1s, and they were no match for the American Bradley. There were many instances of Bradleys encountering BMPs during the 1991 Gulf War, and the results were very one-sided. And we were butchering those things left and right in, uh, in armored stand-up fights. They would come across an armored column, they would destroy the lead and trail vehicles, bottling up the enemy in between. And uh, if the enemy was on equal footing or anything, it, it wouldn't matter. I mean, it, they, just, they didn't stand a chance. It was completely unfair. And that's what we strive for. The Bradley's dominance did not come down exclusively to firepower or armor. The winning edge was the ability to draw first blood. The big thing in any armored vehicle battle is who spots the enemy first, who engages first, who fires first. And that's where the Bradley had the big advantage. The BMP's 2A28 73mm gun has a range of 1,300 meters, but is only accurate to about 500 meters. The Bradley is still deadly accurate at up to six times that range. So what usually happened when a Bradley encountered a BMP is that the Bradley saw the BMP really early at 2,000 meters, 3,000 meters, engage first and hit first. And that, that's always the secret in armored vehicle warfare. See him first, fire first, hit first. You do that, you win the battle. I mean, you look at the Iran-Iraq war, that was nine years of them fighting to a stalemate. And then you look at what the US Army did and the heavy brigade combat teams, and I'm talking within 100 hours, we pushed everybody out of Kuwait back into Iraq. It's almost closing time, but Greg wants to get one big piece out of the way before they call it quits. You can't reach up that far. Oh, yeah, I can. That thing reaches. You think it'll reach over to the center of this? I don't know, Greg. Yeah, yeah. yeah I go. think so. Yeah, no problem. How much do you think it weighs? Not very much. We'll see. Watch your head, Roy. OK, I'm coming out. We don't want to hit anything important. <laughs> the head would be the best shot. I had a CAT scan. It says it's a void there. OK. Close that hatch, and we're done. But the BMP doesn't want to make anything easy. Get it on there. All right, Greg, give it a little bit. See what happens. Hold it, Greg, hold it. Hold it. I got to go inside. There's something wrong. Something might be. Let it down. You got something hung up in there. Hold it, Greg. Yeah? There's one bolt. Story of our lives, I right? I think it's a bent bolt now. One bolt. <laughs> Take it up. Pop goes the weasel. <laughs> We're going to put it on like stands, that. go inside, and finish stripping out everything that's there, all the electronic components and stuff. and go through all the wiring systems and pull it all out, and then we'll sandblast inside. 
make it beautiful. Just cleaning off the remainder of the paint that's left on the on the gun mantle, just off the, so that the, the, the paint adheres a little bit better. You know, turns in excellent condition. You know, like for something this old that's been set out in the weather this long. You know. No big bomb holes in it or anything. Pretty good. <laughs> Not a bad way to end the day. A big piece came off, making way for the inside to be restored. But with only hours to go before he heads back to his job in California, Greg still can't put down his torch. He knows this is his last chance to work on the hull for the next two weeks. Back home from two weeks in California, Greg and his buddies get ready for the next phase of his BMP restoration. Greg is trying to drop his gleaming engine back into place. A little bit more. Right there. Take it down a little. Start taking it down. Cable down. OK. Let her down, Greg. Cable down. Let it down. Down. Back up. That's it. No, it's not it. Take it up a little. Okay. Want to pick it up? Greg. Yeah. All right. Take it okay. up just a little bit. Huh? Maybe boom it back a little the bit. The grime and rust from two desert wars have been stripped away. Now the BMP gets prepped for a paint job. This red is just the primer, a standard color with bodywork. Hard of work as it is, there is a gratification to this, and that's when you get done and you stand back and just look at it, man. It's running good and it looks good. That's that's the rewards that you get from this. But before they can start painting, the desert gets soaked. and the rain will not stop. Strapped for time and cash, Greg doesn't have a choice. He's sandblasting small pieces for the BMP. Well, right now, uh, the rain has been relentless. Rain, 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 won't let up. He's out there in the rain, sandblasting like a dog. I mean, I can't believe it, man. We gotta tend to his attitude right now. When he comes in, he's gonna wanna kill something. So. I would recommend you guys hide when he first quits uh, sandblasting. What the hell are you doing? Well, shit, I'm trying to get ahead here, right here while you're out there sandblasting in the rain. Well, yeah, I told you we were going to sandblast that. Yeah, but okay. I thought I'd save us a little bit of time. Who in the died and left you, boss? <laughs> you do it all yourself. I'll, I don't give a if it never gets done. No, I'm OK. Later, I'll kill somebody. It hasn't stopped raining for five days. And this is like, normally, it's like 95 degrees this time of year. So Nevada, that's why I moved here, to get away from that. See, and here we are. And we're trying to get work done. So, you know. To finish the BMP, Greg wants more than shiny, pretty surfaces. He wants the inside looking as good as it does on the outside. This is my hobby, um, and this is what relaxes me. It grounds me, not to use a pun. Yuri is a project manager in Silicon Valley at one of the world's most successful and celebrated internet companies. He and Greg met while working at the Littlefield Collection in California. A wizard with outdated technology, Yuri is Greg's best hope for restoring the BMP's radio. The vacuum tubes are glowing. You can measure capacitances, resistances, inductances. You can't do any of that stuff with computers. You can actually get your hands on the electronics and the technology of these radios that were made in the 1930s and the 1940s, and that's powerful for me. On the battlefield, information is a weapon. It's as critical as ammunition or troops. By the time uh, 
World War II started in 1939. The Germans had a full command and control structure to guide their tanks. You had a command tank. You had every battle tank had a transmitter receiver. The airplanes had radios. The airplanes would fly over, transmit the enemy's position to the command tank. The command tank would dispatch the battle tanks. 50 years after World War II, information on battlefield positions is still essential to winning. In the 1991 Gulf War, the American Army learned that vital lesson. Communication across a theater of action was essential to a coordinated attack. Fighting against the BMPs, the Bradley's communication technology was head and shoulders above the Iraqis. Computers, GPS, and solid state technology handily defeat the BMP's 60s era comm systems. You're spread wide across the battlefield, so you've got a lot of independent operators out there. You know, your platoon leaders, and platoon sergeants operating uh, groups of four Bradleys at a time. And to control that and those fires, because these fires reach, you know, three kilometers. So if you're firing out of sector, I mean, three kilometers with an armor-piercing round, I mean, you could ruin someone's day you don't want to mess with. Lieutenant Colonel Bill Sheehy commanded a Bradley before they went digital. It was just analog. We talked on radio to each other. We had flags we'd signal with. The current A3 Bradleys use highly sophisticated digital communication systems. This allows us to link all the weapons platforms, the Bradleys and Abrams together to maximize lethality. These Bradleys were built with lessons learned from the Gulf War. And in that, we had a tactical navigation system. We had a laser range finder and many other enhancements that helped us be able to shoot, move, and communicate on the battlefield. Since then, the A3 has been introduced, which is, allows us to track two targets at the same time and kill two targets almost simultaneously. Greg and his volunteers have sandblasted every inch of the BMP. They've ground away loose ends and repaired the battle damage. They've replaced hundreds of meters of wiring. They've got parts moving that haven't budged in decades. Now just a little bit. And it all culminates in this milestone, turning on the engine. OK, here we go. Master switch. This is the, this is the flame test. Come on, baby. OK, what's wrong here? Here we go. Incredibly. Greg's mail-order check engine has exploded to life on the second try. But there's too much smoke. OK, we had good oil. I think we have, well, I probably have air in the, in the fuel lines is what's happened. When it, when it crapped out, it just got to get the fuel up from the, the back of the tank. That's all. I'm checking for oil leak, so it's very important that we jump on it right away. All it's doing is blowing out smoke. That ain't nothing. And maybe if it backfires a little bit and does its thing, it's all right, because we don't want a flame to ignite anything, any of the uh, diesel that's running out. These things smoke when you start them up anyway. Yeah, they do. And uh, this, has, this engine probably hadn't been run in 20 years, so it's, you know, it's going so to clean it. itself out. And we're going to drive it, and it'll be fine. It's close, but not quite there. Roy and Greg are going to take another shot at the engine. And everything is history. While this BMP waits months to come back to life, these Bradleys are reborn and sent back to the war in Iraq at a rate of eight a day. The overhaul is part of the US military's reset process. When you get back, you go through reset. You get your equipment turned in, you get new equipment back, you reset personnel, uh, and you start your training cycle as soon as you possibly can to get ready to go back. Because there's two things. You're either in the fight or you're trained to go back into the fight. And that's the reality of today. There, there is no real break. It's just prepping to go the next time. It's not if I'm going to go again. It's when I'm going to go again.
Since Greg Taylor started the tank overhaul on his BMP, the BAE plant has repaired or upgraded close to 500 Bradleys. Well, I'll tell you one thing right now. If we don't get this thing running right now today, we're going to jump in that T-55 and we're going to go blow some up because that'll really make me feel good. There's something wrong with the BMP's engine. Greg and Roy are working their way through a maze of Russian wiring, tubes, and pipes. We're not getting fuel through to the uh, heads right now. We got it in the filter, but we got the governor that's low on oil right now. We think that that's what's blocking off the engine right now from getting fuel. So I'm going to put oil in the uh, governor, and hopefully we'll be back in business. Even the best tank experts can be mystified by their machines, and they don't get to call 1-800 for customer service. Almost, it's like it's not getting fuel. Well, it's not. You know, it's because it, the, the, the... And you got the fuel pump on. Yeah, but the, rack, the rod that controls the fuel to the injectors is not moving. They're just sitting there. make a call to somebody that knows about BMP engine if the rod freezes up. And he's probably gone home by now. <sighs> oh, I was going to go join Iraqi National Guard. Look, I ain't going to do nothing now. They got crappy equipment. And of course, the manuals don't show anything. They don't tell you how to, if this happens, how to fix it. They don't tell you. They just tell you how to run the optics and turn the turret around. They don't give a if it runs or not. <clears throat> Trigger monkey to do that. So much for the toast. <sighs> Just another damn reason I don't like Nevada. I'm coming home, California. I'm coming home. Greg has lost this battle, but he's determined to win the war. For now, He's going to lay down his arms, rest up, and try again another day. That's what makes him one of the best in the game. Yuri manages to get the BMP radios working. The second set is installed in Greg's T-55, another Russian tank from the Cold War. The good thing about working with Greg is, if the restoration doesn't work out, at least you still get to play. Just driving the vehicles is like going into a time machine. But when you get the radios working, it's like adding an extra dimension to that time machine. We actually get to hear the sounds as the soldiers heard it inside the tanks back when these were brand new and top of the line technology. After a lifetime of repairing busted vehicles, Greg has no illusions about how much more work and struggle are left with his BMP. They used to say that, you know, you do what you love and the money will come. That's not true anymore. The money doesn't come. With Greg's passion and dedication, the BMP will one day be back. But right now, he has little time to worry about how exactly he's going to get his BMP finished. It's Sunday, and he's got to head back to California to be at his job Monday morning. He'll return in two weeks, ready for another round on the tank overhaul battleground.